Okay, I think we're all doing fine. Um, okay, this guy's been wanting to go at it with Jack for a while. So, I mean, if you guys don't mind just letting them go, that would be really ideal. I told him I'd do it in my server where um, people won't, like, butt in, but I don't have any mods in here. So if we can if we can respect that, that would be fucking sweet. Um, perspective, you want to talk about subjectivism entailing non-cognitivism, I believe? Well... <laughs> Like, this is the thing. Like, I guess what the way I would describe it is what I would say is that when we talk about subjectivism, um, right. I would say that it's um, it, the the the, sec that the structure of a subjectivist framework would be embedded upon non-cognitivist of, of a non-cognitivist structure. So it would be essentially secondary propositions built upon the preferences of the individual that are given in a non-cognitive form, in the form of desire or uh, whatever it may be. So. You know, you have a preference that's inherent uh, to your being. Like you like chocolate, and then you create a secondary preference upon that, which entails how you would achieve chocolate, or whether you um, would like another form of chocolate product, or whatever it may be. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can challenge the primary, the primary uh, non-cognitive inference, uh, um, not inference, non-cognitive uh, attitude, or whatever you may be disposition uh, in the first place. And that was the point that I've been trying to make. Just seem to be using subjectivism in a proprietary. What do you mean? I just take it that subjectivism in the literature is a cognitivist. Yeah, but I would say it's cognitivist in the sense that it's um, quasi-realist, in the sense that, like, when we look at it, it's um, the the way in which it functions is in reflection to secondary propositions and not primary propositions the actual the primary propositions cannot be challenged like the fact that you like chocolate or or whatever it may be that is something that is entailed within in your being like the the actual quote unquote good of the scenario is not something that can be assumed or um structured and given uh based upon you know your attitudes you cannot choose the primary propositions but you can like build secondary propositions upon that I think that the best the best expression of uh, of something like this would probably be like Stevenson and uh, norm expressivism. Those are non cognitivist views. Yeah, I know that he's non cognitivist, but I'm saying that I think that that's how subjectivism works. I Stevenson don't understand does, what you like, mean like, by saying. That's so Stevenson, Stephen, well, look, look at it like this. Stevenson holds epistemological um, rigor to to uh, um, to norm expressivism. So he's like, he basically says like, they, just because like you know like, like it's a non cognitivist um, theory doesn't mean that you don't that you, you can be epistemologically uh, right no matter what you do. And then you start saying that there are certain norms that contradict one another, which allows you to create a system which then um, functions in such a way. I think that is the best you can get out of um, out of a, a non um, non objectivist framework. I don't really understand what you're saying because I'm just saying that I understand subjectivism to be definitionally cognitivist and you're just saying it's non-cognitivist so it just sounds like you're using subjectivism in some non-standard way using that term I mean well if we take like obviously subjectivism as in like if we take subjectivism to be essentially um the cognitive theory that you know you, you're able to um, use your personal feelings, tastes, and opinions to create a structural theory which will allow you to behave. Well, the, the thing is, is that do you give yourself these? The, the, the question I'm asking is, do you give yourself these personal feelings, tastes, or opinions, or are they given to you, and then you build secondary propositions upon them? I would say it's the latter and not the former. I don't think you can. You cannot, like for example, pre. You cannot create a structural theory of value 
um, and then apply that to yourself. That would imply a libertarian version of free will. Just if you see what I'm saying. I, I don't know what free will has to do with it. Because, well, if, how, how, how not? Like, if, if you look at it like this, if you need, like, metaphysical libertarianism to be able to tell yourself what you do and do not like, if subjectivism, if subjectivism is based upon um, notions of value, which are either preconceived, which are preconceived and which you assume, let's say, like you create a cognitivist framework, which allows you to act in such a way that, you know, allows you to achieve your ends. And you tell yourself, like, I like, for example, like chocolate and therefore I will seek chocolate and blah, 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 blah. I think that's essentially nonsense. What you what you actually do is you recognize within yourself a preference which is given to you by nature, and then you create secondary propositions upon that. That means you can't hold yourself that you can't hold that negation. Um, you can't hold that stable. So if your your emotive states change, your system changes with it. You can't just create a system which holds you you stable. I don't see what Sorry, you cut out there, man. I don't see what telling yourself has to do with it. Telling yourself anything has to Well, would you like to like give a like put forward a subjectivist theory and let's see like maybe we'll run through something about it. I mean, I just understand the idea to be something like it's a cognitivist Meta ethic, and the truth maker is some mind dependent fact rather than some mind independent fact. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that if it's but subjectivism, would you agree, is based on feelings, tastes, and opinions? I mean, probably. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what other mind-dependent facts. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would agree. I would agree there. And I think the issue is, is that unless you're a metaphysical libertarian and you can argue that you give yourself these primary foundations for your subjectivist framework, it ultimately bottoms out in, an, in, an, in essentially an emotive framework. You, you are bottoming out in your emotional states, which determine how you will then go on to create the structural theory of value in relation to a subjectivist framework. You're equivocating on a motive there. No, I don't think I am. Like, um, I mean, unless you can, like, so, let's see. Oh, it's, it's hard to do it without, like, a substantive theory to compare it against. Very nice. Could could you just start over? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what much would be gained. I mean, essentially, um, well, the idea of what I'm trying to say is that um, a, a, a cognitive subjectivist position, I think, can only be, um, at, at best, a, something along the lines of like norm expressivism in, in its in its actual uh, how it would turn out. I think anything other than that would, would lead to absurdity because you'd have to have a, meta, a libertarian metaphysical position which allowed you to change your disposition, psychological dispositions, um, before you actually had them. I don't think it's actually possible to do. Uh, and so th that's kind of the point I'm making. It's that if you were to say that, you know, someone, you know, you are, you know, I think, I think I've heard, like, ask yourself and uh, many others actually, um, you know, make like, these are my presuppositions. These are what I value. Um, and this is my system. Well, if his taste changed, so would the system. So if you are, let's say a vegan, because, you know, um, you know, had a distaste of the suffering of animals, um, that then you created a system from that, which then dic apparently dictates your actions. Then you could, 
not hold yourself to that theory. Like I, I would even go so far as like you, you can't actually say it's veganism because I'd say like I'd go into the 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 language of it. But the but let's just say you could say it was like vegan and that's fine. I don't think you could say that you would always follow that framework or that you always should follow that framework. It wouldn't work out because the 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 actual reason you follow the framework in the first place is based off of your psychological dispositions, which pre-exist the, the, the value or structure that you've placed upon it. Uh, it seems like you're making like a very, you're making a very simple, kind of almost innocuous point and overcomplicating it and confusing yourself, right? Because the I issue don't think seems so. to well, be, I mean, if you can show us why. Well, the issue, the issue is right that definitionally, subjectivism is a non-cognitivist. I'm sorry, is a cognitivist metaethical theory. So to say that it's um, non-cognitivist is to misdescribe it, unless you're using subjectivist in some other way than it's standardly used in metaethics. Now, what you could be saying that I would probably agree with, right, is that there's, because the truth makers for uh, moral propositions on subjectivism are mind dependent, which is to say, presumably something like feelings or preferences or desires or whatever, uh, that there's a deep affinity between moral subjectivism and non-cognitivism. So for example, so there may not even really be much at stake in a debate between those two positions, um, you know, except maybe some semantical issues because really both positions are gonna be like, probably harmonized with like some type of projectivism or human theory of motivation and stuff like that, which we see, you know, in that most, uh, most non-cognitivist views, right, have probably been allied with um, human theories of motivation and forth, projectivist views right so it just seems like moral subjectivism is more or less going to have some commitments and is more likely going to harmonize with a position like that and so fundamentally there really isn't a lot at stake in the dispute between them if that's the point that you're making it just seems like true uh to me it seems relatively innocuous i, I guess the, i guess the, the... I wouldn't but say I that the point. I just don't see what the free will. It just seems like all these other, all this other machinery that you're wheeling in about well, the human point, free will. The human is point. The human sort point of, of that. is sort of odious, and and it just seems like there's a basic misunderstanding, right? To say subjectivism is non-cognitivism, uh, or reduces to it because it's just definitionally that's precluded. Well, I mean, when you say it reduces to non-cognitivism, I would probably agree in the sense the human notion of motivation, uh, some, somewhat. Um, I think that the difference that I, I guess what I guess the taught the value of of what I was trying to say with this in the first place was in reference to a previous um, discussion I've had, and it was essentially the limits in which a subjectivist could hold themselves to the. Um, the propositions they create upon, you know, these these uh, motivations, these desires, these you know uh, preferences, and so on. Um, and my point was to essentially say that the 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 reality is, if you're a non-cognitive subjectivist, so on, then I, I, I guess it was. I mean, it was totally in reference to uh, a language debate, actually. But like, I don't want to bring that kind of worms into it, unless you you want to talk about whether. Because like one of the things I, I would argue is that I don't think that subjectivists or um, non-cognitivists um, can be vegans. I don't think that it makes sense. I think that 
veganism is a um, needs a more robust structure, but that can be debated another time. The point I brought that up for is the fact that in, it was in reference to that debate and a debate for um, like the limits of what you can prescribe upon yourself. And the point is, is that both a subjectivist or a non-cognitivist are limited by the foundations of their theories, which is essentially going to bottom out in what I would quote unquote call a non-cognitivist emotive state. I, th I think that they, the, the foundations of what psychological um, propositional states, like the, the sorry, psychological dispositions are always non-cognitive. They're always given to her, uh, these desires, these first order preferences, and then uh, first order desires. And then I would say that that is what you're essentially a slave to in this respect. There is no, there is no um, questioning your preference for chocolate. There is no questioning, you know, your desire for uh, to eat animals or not. Uh, and, and that would be the point. So, like, if you were to try and show that someone was wrong um, in their desire to kill animals by showing, too, that their system is incoherent, quote-unquote, what you'd actually be doing is questioning two of their... that You could either conflict two of their desires and say you have a desire for this and a desire for that, and therefore you're going to have to choose between one or the other, which is fair enough. But then they're free to choose between either of them. You could never say that... Um, you know, that they are inherently wrong for desiring to kill animals. And then you could also say that, let's say someone has a, uh, has a system that's incoherent based upon their approach to killing animals. That doesn't mean that they necessarily shouldn't kill animals, even if they, 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 get, if they want to. That's just the reality of it. That's an unquestionable preference. That is the foundation of their system. It's not something that can be pulled into question. Because then, then you would then it would bring up the points of motivation, is what I was saying. You'd have to be able to, and this is why I was talking about libertarian free will, because then they would have to be able to give themselves their own preferences. Follow. I didn't really follow that, but <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure that it matters because. <clears throat> I just thought that all you were saying was I thought that the point I thought that the point under dispute was that subjectivism is a form of non cognitivism. No, I mean the point of what I was saying, I think you kind of got it more that more or less in terms of when you talk about human motivation was essentially like the, the foundations for both theories are based upon psychological dispositions the individual cannot control and are unquestionable um that that's essentially all I, that that is the you know the yeah, profound but, point but that, <laughs> i'm making it's not nuts it's not like yeah well, that, that, um, to the extent i understand what you're saying it just seems like a very not uh i didn't think it was a big like deal big, either it's a, i didn't think i wasn't trying to make it like a uh, like a crazy, like philosophical, like I'm not writing papers on it or anything. It's not something I yeah, invest in. Yeah, because you're just saying something like you're just saying something like there's a way in which non-cognitive theory, non-cognitivist theories seem to be subjectivist in a broader sense, right? Well, and oh, 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 are we saying that a subjectivist theory is embedded upon the same foundations as a non-cognitivist theory? Okay, yeah, yeah, then I don't, I don't necessarily right. disagree with that. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with. That. You're saying that, sort of like. You're saying there's like some kind of basic um, presuppositions that are going to underlie both non-cognitivist theories and subject, say, and subjectivist theories, and those presuppositions are going to be or at least going to likely be something like a Humean theory of motivation or something like that. Yeah. I don't disagree with that. Maybe Philip. Bro, I couldn't fucking disagree with this guy if I tried to, because I don't know what the fuck he's saying ever. <laughs> but do you disagree with what, what I took to be, what the way I offered a reconstruction of what he was? I don't know. Well, what is Philip? Is Philip here? Uh, wait, you're going to have to say your reconstruction again. 
Well, it's just the idea that although there's like maybe a different, you know, although we can distinguish, we can individuate moral subjectivism as a meta-ethical theory from from non-cognitivist positions, right? That fundamentally there's a deeper sort of um, uh, there's a kind of like a, a there, there are fundamental presuppositions that they share which kind of outweigh in significance whatever differences they have which are going to be that they probably are going to have a same, the same kind of theory of motivation you know some kind of Humean, they're, they're both likely, at least likely to presuppose a Humean or more easily harmonize with some kind of Humean projectivist view. Um, and like the real dispute with them is just going to be a kind of trivial one over moral semantics. Oh, the dispute between them is going to be a trivia one between moral semantics. For moral semantics, yeah. That, that's really all that... There isn't really much at stake in a dispute between a non-cognitivist meta-ethical view and a subjectivist meta-ethical view. Because really, they're fundamentally the same view, Just they just have different semantics. They just have a different understanding of the semantics of moral utterances. No, that sounds about right. No, that was quite a good way to put it. So it what like would you... About... Sorry, go ahead, Manny. I mean, what is this shit about, like, vegans can be subjective? Right? No, but, that, but, that's, but that's, that's a separate issue. I think he just yeah. wants to say... He just wants to say that vegans should resist this whole picture of what the two theories share, right? So that's a whole other dispute, right? But the... Yeah. But the main point that he wants to make, which I gave him a hard time about, perhaps unfairly, in our previous conversation, it seems to me like not actually, seems to me like not actually really objective. I'm just wondering if you disagree with it. Um... I'd have to think about the being committed to projectivism thing, but... Well, I don't I know mean, if it's I... a... I'm but I mean, sure I could see the point. But I'm not sure it's an entailment. Like maybe you could construct a theory that doesn't doesn't. Sorry, that isn't projectivist in character. But it just seems like, at the very least, it's it seems likely, or a more natural fit, or something like that, right? Yeah. No, I get your point there. Now, what uh, I wanted to ask you though. So what do you think is going on with stuff like the Frege Geach problem and Jorgensen's dilemma? Like, do you think those are just... Me? Are... Yeah. Well, because you're saying that... No, I'm you're... just saying that they're going to... They're, well, they're going to have to work that out. But, but the point is, that's going to have something to do with... Uh, I mean, that might just seem like... I could imagine somebody saying the semantics are not really very sort of um, important. Well, maybe in, in the spirit of moving this along. So if PP, PP, you concede to Jack that subjectivism doesn't entail non-cognitivism, right? PP. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I, I would say that it was, it was uh, that's not what I meant in that respect. And I meant pretty much what he just described. So I would, I would concede that point. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then, so and then what he just, described, yeah, I think just, hit the nail on the head. Okay, so one second. So. You concede that it's not the case that subjectivism entails non-cognitivism. You're just agreeing with him that subjectivism and non-cognitivism will harmonize more easily with the Humean theory of motivation. Okay, so yeah, maybe, yeah, essentially that are founded upon the same, um, so, have the same um, okay. uh, like motivational foundations, and well, that was kind of the point I was trying to express in the well, first place. Whether whether they have it or whether they would harmonize more easily with it is, I, I think that getting into that is getting into the weeds when like the major point has been kind of like conceded. So. Well, but, I think, I think, well, one second, uh, I, was just, okay. I was just, just going to say though, um, 
if, if you'd prefer me to frame it as conceded and then reframe so that it actually makes sense, we can say that. But the point is you agree subjectivism <laughs> doesn't entail non-cognitivism. Um, there's but what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to point out as well is like, obviously, the, like, we're not getting into the, the argument. I think that me and you, well, was it me and you? Oh, was it, no, it was me and, um, oh, I can't remember his name. It was on, uh, it was on it was, Brin, so uh, what happened? Yeah, it, was, uh, yeah. it was you and um, about Z. veganism. It was you and yeah. Dr. Z, and you were saying that subjectivism and veganism uh can't, yeah can't that was that was the primary point of the discussion so, so, um so and i, I wasn't well, saying that it entails and so and i was let's just in the interest of just having a clear topic since we've cleared up the the subjectivism non-cognizant thing do you want to make the case about subjectivism and veganism being incompatible do you want to argue for your robust <laughs> realism like any of those are probably good topics we're going to burn out of time soon because t-jump is coming to debate jack but you know, if you want, oh, to, right. if you um, want to hit well, those things, if you want to hit I mean, like if things. there's limited time, if there's limited time, I could bring up the whole subjectivist vegan thing. I mean, essentially, the Frege Geach problem is is probably the pretty much where I was kind of going with it. Um, whether a, whether well, a subjectivist. Wait a sec, just just so we have a clear proposition, and then I'll I'll back out. What you were saying okay. in that debate was that subjectivism and veganism are incompatible. That was the debate proposition, as far as I remember. Um, no, it was, it, it was, um, uh, I didn't, that wasn't the debate proposition. The debate proposition was, I, I can, I'll find it. Um, one second. Well, either that, uh, unless he changed it to something that's just non uncontroversial. No, it, it got changed like halfway through, like because um, what I said, like what we had was the when we're having the debate. Um, it got changed to that, but it wasn't actually that they were like logically uh, incompatible. Well, okay, it wait. Was... Well, then, well, then wait. Well, then maybe we don't need to do that. You agree? There's not a contradiction there. So if, if well, the issue I would say that like a subjectivist, like like in the in terms of PP, can you answer that? You you agree? That it's not. A, it was yeah. It wasn't a direct contradiction. That that was like the the mis like the misunderstanding of the dis, of the debate because that's not what I I said. Like I essentially said that the I was making a point about language and that veganism wouldn't be able to um as a as a term in terms of the philosophy of language wouldn't have a foundation to be um held to if it was relying upon internal mental states because private language would have to exist for that and i was making a wittgensteinian point of attacking that okay, so then right. you would be so if you were to describe yourself as a vegan i wouldn't be able to know what you meant okay um, so let's i'm just trying to get a topic out so i can back out so okay so we understand subjectivism doesn't entail non-cognitivism we understand there's no logical contradiction with being a vegan and a subjectivist this is good so then the other kind of like the main thing that you kind of do is you argue for what seems to me like a robust realism. Maybe you should run that argument and then we can um, finish on that or something. Um, well, I, I guess I can. Um, essentially, I'm, I'm a Hegelian. Um, so that's probably why none of you understand this. Um, <laughs> um, the, the argument um, is essentially founded upon... Um, I guess the easiest way to describe it would be what Levinas says, that there is a fundamental equality between individuals um, for, for to allow epistemology or any epistemological uh, structure to develop so that we require the recognition of another individual as being able to verify and falsify claims before we can create any um, epistemological structure. Uh, this is the, found, uh, the, the, the most foundationally ethical uh, structure that um, Hegel kind of brings up. So essentially, I need to recognize that you have the ability to say something is justified or unjustified in relation to my, what I propose. And that, at that very level is um, the very foundation of that level is language itself. You can't even create a structure of language without another individual. Excuse me, fuck now. Um, so essentially, you, you need mutual cooperation before you can have any knowledge claim. And this is this is like a popular position in um continental philosophy um like it's i think sartre even agrees with this and so on um essentially the the position is that knowledge itself is dependent upon mutual cooperation and hegel kind of takes this position and he says right well this um you know like this recognition of the other 
is a power dynamic in which we try and assert our uh, our own you know um cognition our own like inductive um propositions upon objects if you think about it in the wittgensteinian um notion of slab you know like when he's uh well, the example when he's got the two language the the two uh speakers trying to create a language and he says that they're pointing towards a slab of rock and one of them says slab it's at that point in which the other acknowledges the properties of that object that it actually gains the signification of slab and that we can metaphysically divest what it means to be a slab from let's say another chunk of rock um that's like at the very that is the very foundation of knowledge itself right and all, all claims um and hegel says that this is an ethical relationship based upon the equality of individuals being able to verify and falsify one's own um assertions and he places this all within a theory of value essentially uh, i try and assert something is good for myself even in an egoistical sense i'll be mistaken because I could not have metaphysically divested it without your assistance. So you construct my ego just as much as I do. And the if you wanted to read more about this, I would even say that Lacan is a is someone that like you know writes about this sort of um, um, aspect of the fragmentation of subjectivity, and that subjectivity itself isn't um, a holistic, psychologically um, given notion. I don't know my ego, I don't know my preferences, I don't know my uh, interests inherently. Um, although I have that base motivation to act, which I cannot deny, I don't know how to act, I don't know what I'm trying to achieve, and I don't know um, where I should look to achieve it. And so we require an ethical foundation, epistemological ethical foundation with the other, which can then say whether something is good, bad, right or wrong. And that's where you get, you know, the philosophy of right. And that's what I would say is like my theory of robust realism at its foundational level. I can obviously elaborate on anything you would like us to. Oh, and if you actually, if you do want like a more um, in-depth analysis of this, I did do a video on it called... Uh, why objective ethics why there why ethics is objective even if there is no god oh i mean it it doesn't sound like what you gave was an argument more like some kind of outline of what the argumentative strategy would be yeah i mean i was just trying to give like so, a brief description of the position just because I, I, I thought we only had like a couple of minutes before you t jump yeah, so I mean, I'm not really in a position to evaluate what you said, you know, because I, I mean, it's kind of like, think, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if you, if you want like a better overview of the position, um, the video is probably the best bet. And then you can tell us if you have any like critique of the video, like then you can just tell us why that's wrong. Uh, and then we can have a debate on that. Um, in the future, or a discussion on that, if if you if you disagree, are you are you? Uh, I mean, what's your metaphysical position? Well, I guess you could say I'm a relativist, right? And that's like um, like a socio cultural relativist in relation to um, is that like um, like nominalism kind of like as in like value is like uh, gained through purely through like inference, but that doesn't have to be embedded upon like um, any ontology. No, I think that uh, value properties are perceived uh, are perceived in the world. So in that sense, my view is similar to Levinas's, but I don't think there's a right or wrong way to perceive those properties. Mm, but I mean, Levinas is like uh, like uh, you know the ethics of the face, like at the end of Totality and Infinity. I I I, I use that I use that a lot actually. It's a uh, because uh, I find it very valuable. Um, I really don't think he disagrees very much with um, Hegel. But I mean, Hegel gets charged with the theory, like, you know, being a relativist. But he, like, the point is, it's not that there isn't um, a relativity between, you know, um, um, like our perception of right, but that our, epistemologi our epistemology is the reason why that there is a difference. Not necessarily, the, there's not an ontological difference, but there is an epistemological differences between societies and their ability to divest um, and conceptualize theories of right. And that can only progress as the language community and the epistemology de uh, develops 
through that society. Well, I don't really, I don't really know a lot about Levinas. I haven't read Levinas, and I think even if I did read it, I wouldn't understand it. Um, but from what I understand, he has a view in which he thinks that you can look out into the world and perceive normative demands. And so that's, I, I would be perfectly happy describing my view that way. Yeah, I think, I think Hegel kind of makes the same claim and it's, it's on the, um, that there is a normativity embedded within being, which forces, which is essentially the foundations for, for our, um, our ability to, um, embed inferences like uh, there's a guy called like robert brandom who wrote the book um what's it called oh god <laughs> uh oh god I can't remember. It, it's it's irrelevant anyway you can go actually I, I'll, I'll link it in the chat he does a lecture on his inferentialism anyway and the idea is that the 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 possibility like not only like he uses seller's critique of empiricism and he also uses um uh, some, I can't remember whose critique of modal logic, where it basically says that modal logic necessarily includes the possibility of applying to uh, an, an object that it could possibly be the case that it actually does obtain truth value, um, and he kind of shows this is the the foundation of being uh, related to normativity. That the, uh, and I think if you wanted a, another another thinker that relates to this point is uh, actually Heidegger when he describes the fittingness of the concept that being itself uh, gives us the appropriate, the, 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 the limits to which a, a concept can actually be applied. And I, th I would say that, that that is the case. And I'd say that's why, like, if you take someone like Peter Geach, he's not necessarily saying that we create, you know, um, we don't create colors or whatever like that when we, um, you know, conceptualize like what red, blue, yellow is. But what we actually do is we create concepts and apply them against the world. And that then becomes a signification of an aspect of being. And I think that's what Hegel and Levinas are doing as well. I mean, I could be wrong with Levinas because I do need to reread Levinas again. But with Hegel, I'd certainly say that. Well, I think that I share a view with Brandon to some extent and that I believe that um, beliefs and desires are, are commitments. But I think where I uh, disagree with him is that um, he understands commitment as requiring some kind of um, justification uh, with respect to one's peers. So there's a kind of um, social yeah. external, externalist um, sort of um, uh, feature that I think he's getting from Hegel, or at least yeah, he's, he's definitely getting that from Hegel. <laughs> yeah, and so I don't, I don't think that I think that beliefs and desires are are internal oughts, and so that the notion the notion of commitment can be um, can be non socially just say individualistically um described i think i think that's what i think brandon would deny that yeah i, I, Hegel, I, I would Hegel as well would, I, Hegel, I, Hegel would deny that so i think that's going to be a fundamental disagreement yeah i think that's that's essentially where we would like diverge um i think the reason brandon would disagree was from hegel and um, from wittgenstein as well because you'd be saying like essentially there would be in, there would be an inability to conceptualize a position which does not exist within a common domain um which can which allows an individual to create a significant a signifier um or a concept which can then be you know held constant within language Otherwise, you'd you'd basically end up with uh, I, I would say like you know like the kind of the Frege Geach problem where you're going to go all right well um, is my description of my position the same position that I was describing before am I am I saying the same thing when I'm signif when I create this signification of of this preference or this desire and I think that this is why you kind of end up um, within the Hegelian notion that there is an ontology of humanity there is an ontology of man and then 
so on onto, and I would argue, a sentient disposition, which um, is what we are describing when we are doing ethics. We are actually like, um, it's, I think he says there is only the self understanding the self, um, but in in so much that that is a communal um, endeavor that requires like uh, mutual cooperation to to actually do. I mean, we could definitely discuss that at some point if if you'd like. Yeah, well, I think I see. I don't think that my view commits me to uh, to a position that falls foul of you know the logical privacy objections of Wittgenstein, because I think that um, the way I understand the private language I, argument. I would like, uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting, Jake, but the key debater T. Jump finally arrived so um how, how would, you, would you guys prefer to do this would you like this in general do you guys prefer a special room where nobody else is allowed to speak you guys decide we still have about 10 minutes i think you should ask the truth she's not here oh okay <laughs> I, I thought the troyer was going to debate to you uh so you, you got to it Um, well, I'm happy to shoot off now if you if uh, T jumps here and we can follow this up another time. Um, right. But, you, but um, I was interested in understanding, um, obviously, the, the position like why you think that it wouldn't violate Wittgenstein's private language. I don't know how I don't know how long we've got, so I, I don't want to like you know try and like like you know prevent you from like getting ready for your debate and stuff. Um, so yeah, like I mean, it's up to you. Like obviously, depend on how well, long. Well, Goblin Scroll will probably get mad. So if you're free, like I don't know how she wants this to go. Maybe in an hour. Um, I can. I, I told can me friends. Explaining. I was going to say I told me friends I'd I'd go and play games with them. So well, I'd, it, I'd could be, that. it could be um, tomorrow. Or tomorrow. Later. Tomorrow's tomorrow's fine for me. Um, what, what time zone are you in? Eastern. Eastern, so it's not like GMT, sure. Eastern time. Eastern same time, I can't even remember. It's like four hours ahead, I think we're four hours I ahead, or oh, three hours ahead of that. No, I think you're five. Wait, are you in Scotland, or are you somewhere else? Yes. Yes, um, Newcastle, so Scotland, five, yeah, yeah so five hours. Five hours. Five hours ahead, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'll be up pretty late. So, I mean, like, probably, like, maybe even, like, 3 a.m. or something like that for me would be, would you still be around, like, was it, like, 10, 10 p.m. for you? Yeah, I'll still be around. All right, yeah, cool. So we can follow that up then if uh, still about, right? Well, I'll let you get to your debate, and uh, thanks for the discussion, man.